Zoom isn't trying to do a million different things. So it's not surprising to me that Zoom is focused on user experience and focused on simplicity, whereas nothing against a Microsoft or Google or an Amazon, but you, you can't be everything to everybody. I'd like to welcome Phil Simon to the Productivities Podcast once again. Long time no talk to, Phil. <laughs> I've got a lot to say. So the last time you were on the program, and we're going to put this in the show notes, we were talking about Slack for dummies, right? That's what we were kind of getting into. And we teased in that episode that you had another book coming out, one almost one on top of the other. And this one is about the app that we're actually using to do this, to take care of this conversation, which I never used to use this 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 app for this. I used to use Skype all the time, but Zoom has become uh, something that more people are using now more than ever, uh, largely due to the fact that there's more people working from home right now, especially in the season that we're currently in as we're recording this. But also, um, you know, I mean, it it's got so many things that you can kind of wrap your head around. So the, the idea of Zoom for Dummies just seems like a no-brainer at this point, right? Yeah, I did a decent enough job with the Slack for Dummies book that they gave me first bite the Apple. But before we talk about Zoom, what did you use for recording in Skype, Ecamm? I was using a uh, call recorder. Yeah. Yeah. And I, oh, okay. and, and here's the thing, the reason, and I think this is a, a nice little thing to bring up is Skype was the ubiquitous record. Like it's what we used, right? Like it was like Skype was like, Oh, I'll Skype you later. Like that was the thing. And zoom has kind of taken right. over in that. Now, why do you think that that's the case? Um, considering that like, again, Skype had a stronghold and zoom kind of, I mean, it's zoom has not been around for a really not, not been around for a long time. Yeah, well, Eric Wan, who used to work at WebEx, and then Cisco bought it, I want to say in 2009 for $3.2 billion. He spent two years there talking to enterprise customers because WebEx, as you know, was mostly an enterprise tool, trying to get him to fix it. And Wan, in interviews, has said that he never talked to a happy WebEx customer. And at the time that cloud computing and APIs were blowing up, he said, we need to blow this puppy up, build it from scratch. And as any successful company... I said, well, we're doing fine. Let's take it easy, Sparky. And he said, screw this. And he took 40 talented engineers, started Zoom, and they did well. They were reasonably popular up until the end of 2009. They had 10 million primarily enterprise users. Well, then COVID hits. And it is interesting. And I've got a bunch of theories, but Zoom made it brain dead simple, mm -hmm. right, to do video calling. And you wouldn't need a plug-in like your, the recorder thing that you mentioned or e-cam or whatever. And it shipped with all this functionality. And importantly... You didn't need to set up an account. Now you do if you want to host a meeting right. or do webinars on all the fancy stuff we talk about in the book. We can get back to that in a bit. But if you had a link, you could use it. I don't think that worked with Skype. You, with Skype, you'd have to... You had to have an account. Right. And in the past, whether it's WebEx or Skype, some of those tools didn't necessarily work well um, on every device. Right. WebEx alone, if you didn't have the right plugin or the right browser, the right version, right? I'm sure you've seen those spoofy... YouTube videos if life were a conference call. Yeah, Citrix right? is like, oh, I have to download it again, but I just downloaded it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So <laughs> Zoom removed all the friction, which is exactly what their customers wanted. And when Zoom went from 10 million users at the end of 2000, and, I'm sorry, did I say 9? I meant 19. Mm -hmm. 200 million users in late February of 2020, and then 300 million users in, they say, April people said, wow, there's no friction. There should be more friction because right. we've got people who are Zoom bombing. But to be fair, Eric Wan and the Zoom management folks didn't envision it as a consumer tool. So one of the points I make in the book is that if you look at the iPhone when that shipped in 2007, it did not portend the immediate death of the BlackBerry. In fact, BlackBerry sales increased for four years. Why? Because aside from being too expensive, the iPhone didn't come with the enterprise controls, whether it's security or private app store or whatever. Once the iPhone came with that, then BlackBerry went. Well, and, the, and the other thing is people were not comfortable with something that didn't have a keyboard. Yes. Like it did not have a keyboard and that was the barrier to entry. What was, in, what, what I found interesting about Zoom and I've been using Zoom for a long time now, uh, mainly for coaching client calls, things like that. I wasn't using it for podcasting initially because audio tracks weren't, weren't going to, weren't something you could separate very easily early on. There was a lot of, cause it wasn't designed for that initially. Like that, that wasn't a user um, feature that was necessarily something that they were looking at. It, it came on 
And what was funny about that is that was added almost without fanfare. Like, I'm like, oh, I can do this now. Like, they've had to iterate really, really quickly. And, and I would say that that's evidenced in, in the fact that they had to really level up their security once people started to use it at that enterprise level. That was something that happened pretty quickly for, for Zoom. Yeah, it was a good problem to have, right? What company wouldn't want to say, oh, wow, we've got 3,000% more users. <laughs> at such a time. However, it still is a problem. Now, right. to be fair, Zoom really responded well. I'm hard-pressed to think of a company, I'm no spring chicken, that took care of so many issues so quickly. And for 90 days, it was all about security. In fact, I wrote chapter 10, the one on security at the end, because it was just changing by the day. I mean, I was getting updates for Zoom two, three times a week. And then along with the meetings, uh, again, which was also changing. And some of the changes were much more minor, right? So putting at the forefront a security tab, right? right? If you're the meeting host or being able to stop people from renaming themselves because they're going in under different pretenses. Some of the other changes are like encryption. That is not just switching a couple lines of code. Mm -hmm. uh, that is ground up type thing. And they made this acquisition on, I think it was May 1st, and they're working on ED encryption, but they are taking it seriously. And you've even seen, whether it's Facebook or Google, um, even WebEx, I think now let's do virtual backgrounds. So all of this means Microsoft Teams is making some, uh, they're going to have the seven by seven grid. So all this does benefit consumers and the folks at Zoom realize that apart from security, if they don't offer the same features, particularly because it's on, in some cases, software as a service, monthly service, this is not uh, Verizon or AT&T getting locked into a two-year contract. Right. If, if you want to get out of Zoom, you, you can, there are alternatives, but I'm a fan. I, I find it incredibly useful. And when you finish the phone, uh, call the meeting, you get the audio download, you get the video download, you get the text, and mm. you may not need it, but I think it was Kafka who said, tis better to have and not need than need and not have. And that's my Zen for the day. So <laughs> it's a very good point though, because I mean, while I'm not recording this Zoom call because I have my Rodecaster Pro, um, it is nice to have, I mean, that creates, I mean, if I left the auto recording on, it's nice to have that automatic backup. Like it's literally like, again, it the 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 sense that Zoom has made it so simple, not necessarily easy. Cause remember some people have some, that, I mean, they're not terribly tech savvy, some people, but by making it simple with the barrier to entry was lower. What got, what was your first experience with zoom? Like, like when did you start using zoom and, and when did you realize like, Hey, this is, this is a game changer when it comes to this particular niche. It was ironic. Um, we started using it at the end of last year uh, when I was working at ASU as a professor for, for meetings. Um, and then once COVID hit, it became the standard. Ironically, I used Slack a lot more than Zoom because I was using Slack for my class. And because my classes, the spring semester of 2020, were always supposed to be remote. Um, and I'd go back and forth, right? Because if, you know, so for example, with Slack, as you probably know, you can share a screen or you could do a limited call up to, I think, 15 people. But in July yeah. of 2019, Slack said, we're not going to support remote control. Right, we don't want to be in that business. Mm -hmm. Whereas you, know, you can do that with Zoom. So I'd go back and forth, and then of course I'd use Teams because the publisher Wiley didn't have a Slack or a Zoom account. So I actually was joking about this. This might have came up last time. To the extent that these tools are so similar, um, you're going. Wait, why can't I share this in Zoom? Oh, wait, because I have my Microsoft Teams hat on or my Slack hat on. So it, because it was so similar to. Slack and, and there are differences, right? But you can do, you can make create channels, right? Right. I can, um, uh, gosh, upload files. I could share screens. I can record. I can support apps. There were so many similarities, and I don't really think it's either or because even though they're they're close enough, right? If Teams went down and Zoom went down, could we do this podcast through Slack? Sure, we'd we're figure it out. We're pretty we'd tech make, savvy. We'd make but, it work. Yeah, but I mean, whereas with Slack. And you can forward emails to Slack, as you know, but you really need to be invited to that workspace. Or now with Slack Connect, you can have the direct the, the shared channels. With Zoom, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't have that kind of work feel. If you wanted to talk to your grandmother, hold a Pilates class, or hold a wedding, or do a, a concert, right? All these ways people are using Zoom, Slack doesn't really do that. No, so it, it, and yeah. and also it. So I'll give you an example. You mentioned Pilates class. My mother in law takes her Pilates class right now over Zoom. I've had to um, do some tech support. So there's an example. I've had to do a bit of tech support with that. But it's been pretty simple because, um, again, uh, she she messages me 
and I know I'm not speaking out of school on this, but she's like, I don't remember my Zoom password and all that stuff. I'm like, well, did she send you the link? To Oh, yeah, I have the link. I'm like, you don't need one then. Right, you just right. get to go in. And she's like, oh. Uh, and the, the moment of relief. Like, that was the thing. It's like, oh, the barrier. Like, I now no longer have to worry about keeping track of a password, doing all that. My Zoom account, all I have to do is have the app installed on my iPad, iPhone, whatever it is. And I can just click the link and it automatically opens up. I mean, it asks you, I guess, but you know, it opens up the, the Zoom app and boom, you're in there. You get to type in your name. They know, I mean, and if it's a, it's a, a, like an example in the Pilates class, it's not like it's some stranger that you're going in. Like she knows that she's in that class. So it's, I mean, the variety of use cases. And I think that's the example that, that I think that the, the correlation between Slack and Zapier, which by the uh, Slack and Zoom rather, which by the way, you can use Zapier to connect them quite nicely, um, is they are flexible and durable in the way that you can use them to scale whatever you really want to. Like if you want to run, like you said, your class in Slack, like, you know, the, the communication component, the written communication in Slack, you can do that. And then you can go on Zoom and actually teach a class. So there's a lot of use cases that, um, because it's so um, flexible that things that you may never thought you could do, uh, Zoom, in, in this case, we're going to talk about, allows you to do it in, all, in, in ways that you never thought you could. Yeah, I could have written a 150-page book about webinars, a 100-page mini book about reports in Zoom and administrative controls. And the me meetings chapter, chapter four is a beast. It's about 50 pages. Um, that easily could have been a 200-page book. So uh, I tried to split things in as much as there's plenty of material, but there are also plenty of tips and resources. And yeah, plus this is always changing. Zoom mm -hmm. this, earlier this week announced Zoom at home. So there's a chapter in the book, it's 12 or 13, I don't have it in front of me on Zoom rooms, these VR yep. type things. And I make predictions in the book about where it's going, whether it's AI or machine learning, AR, VR, voice recognition, better translations, better intelligence. I mean, if you keep all of your communications in Zoom, not unlike Slack, I mean, think about you and I exchange a few text messages about this, but as opposed to email, as opposed to SMS, then in theory, you have this corpus of knowledge that you could use to mind. Wow, we really haven't heard from Mike today. Mike, is everything okay? Or while respecting privacy, I could see two, three years down the road, uh, companies like Gong. I don't know if you ever heard of that one. No, I haven't. So I found out about this one on the Michael Lewis podcast, Against the Rules, and Gong software can help people sell because it's analyzing the text. And if you talk too much, right, let's say you talk 70% of the time on a sales call, that's not good, mm -hmm. right? So they can give you these gen gentle nudges. I can see Zoom doing something like that down the road. So Mike, your facial expressions, even though you seem to be happy, you actually, you know, the technology is telling me you're really ticked off. Mm -hmm. And I'd want to know that before you left the company or before your performance dropped. So I, I see the meetings as certainly um, an important piece of it, but it's really just the tip of the iceberg. But the beauty of Zoom, as you pointed out, is that if you only want to use it for, if you want to use Microsoft Word to type a letter, Mm -hmm. Go right ahead. If you wanted to write a manuscript for a book, you can. Um, so there are different levels to it. And I hope the book does a good job of saying, you, know, you don't have to use Zoom phone or webinar or Zoom rooms. If you want to use Zoom meetings and chat or just the meetings part of meetings and chat, you can, but there actually is a whole lot more there. Well, and, and one of the things is when you have a piece of software or software or service that can really help you with, you know, whatever you're trying to do and make things easier and better for you so that you don't have to really think about these things and they can kind of take care of it for you in a lot of ways, that's really helpful. Like the barrier to entry being low and and the fact that you can kind of, uh, again, you can grow with it. I think that's the other thing too. And, and meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it, and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. 
I, I want to take a bit of a break right now to talk about our sponsor who allows for this to happen for you when, you know, and it's, it's Bambi. So when running a business, HR issues can absolutely kill you. Wrongful termination suits, minimum wage requirements, labor regulations, and HR manager salaries aren't cheap. They're an average of $70,000 a year. Well, Bambi, spelled B-A-M-B-E-E, was created specifically for small business. You can get a dedicated HR manager, craft HR policy, and maintain your compliance all for just $99 a month. With Bambi, you can change HR from your biggest liability to your biggest strength. And your dedicated HR manager is available by phone, email, or real-time chat. Maybe you could use Zoom or Slack for this sort of thing. From onboarding to terminations, they customize your policies to fit your business, and they help you manage your employees day-to-day, all for just, again, $99 a month. This is month to month. There's no hidden fees and you can cancel at any time. Now you didn't start your business because you wanted to spend time on HR compliance. I know I didn't. So let Bambi help. Get your free HR audit today. All you need to do is go to Bambi.com slash timecrafting right now to schedule your free HR audit. That's Bambi.com slash timecrafting. So it's spelled B-A-M, that's BAM to the B-E-E dot com slash timecrafting. Give Bambi a try today. Now, I want to shift to the whole idea of webinars with Zoom because that's one area I haven't really explored. And I know you get get into this into the book, and I want to break down some of the book stuff as we make our way through the the rest of the episode here. But people don't normally think of Zoom, and I would say even people have been using it for a while for webinars. They're thinking again terms like WebEx, uh, um, uh, Webinar Ninja, Webinar Jam, all these other ones. Um, what does Zoom bring to the table with webinars that you found that's unique compared to some of the other the platforms that are out there? Well, I'd say that there's a familiarity issue. Zoom was able to take a look at what those WebExes and the other, you know, I've been doing web, either participating in or watching webinars since the mid to late 90s. So not exactly a new idea. Mm-hmm. Um, interestingly, a webinar is a type of meeting. And some people say, well, why do I need webinars? Can I just do a meeting? And the short answer is it depends. Right, because as you know, there are certain roles that Zoom reserves for webinars. Right. Whereas in a meeting, right, we could have 10 people on and each of the 10 people might have something to say. But a university in, a, in addressing 2,000 students don't want 2,000 students to jump in. So it, if you've already used Zoom meetings and chat, it's going to make your learning curve on webinars that much shorter. Right. And they're always thinking about different ways to, to do it and being able to save it and stream it on something like uh, YouTube or Facebook Live. You wouldn't necessarily do that with a meeting, but it, it overlaps. The other thing is just the sheer numbers. So I might have a hundred person license, but I want to do a webinar to 2000 people. Well, do I want to upgrade just for that one meeting mm. when I can employ the webinar plan? So uh, they're certainly more similar than dissimilar, but those are important differences. And the way Zoom is, is set up so flexibly, if you only want webinars for two months, go right ahead. Right. Right. If you only want um, Zoom rooms for a year, you know, so be it. So it, it is very modular. Even with Zoom large meetings, if you say, right, we're, we really need to have a big company wide meeting, we're going to upgrade just for the month. So it's intelligent. They don't want a lot of shelfware and people saying, why are we spending 400 grand a month on this? Uh, when we're really not using it. So uh, yeah, webinar is really, um, you know, really intuitive. And again, a couple of minor differences, but you know, if you've used previous tools, you'll pick it up quickly. One of the things I really liked when I looked at webinars initially with Zoom, which I don't, I don't do a lot of webinars and I'm not using Zoom for webinars right now, is uh, the idea of questions. So when people register, they can answer, they, they can be prompted to answer specific questions. So you can kind of gear your content towards that, which is something that, I know others have done, but they become very uh, onerous to work on. Zoom kind of made it clean. And I think that's the other thing, too, that Zoom has going for it in terms of UI. It's really clean. Like, that seems to be something that's really important to them. Yeah, whether it's questions or polls. And I was just on a – I've got a webinar coming up with the American Bookseller Association to get Zoom for Dummies into the independent bookstores and hopefully help them out because they're really struggling but you certainly would want that other person because if I'm running the webinar and whether I'm doing PowerPoint or just interacting with po- folks, I can't also be doing the administrative side with questions and polls and all that. And the ability to show real-time information, I think is really helpful. Now, again, not that not that it's rocket surgery and I'm sure the other vendors are paying attention to that, but uh, researching the book, I did find that there were some features that Zoom webinars currently ship with that others didn't. But mm-hmm. again, to the extent that Zoom is so hot right now, 
I'd be shocked if the WebEx folks weren't saying, oh, wait, we need breakout rooms or we need polls or whatever because they didn't have them. So yeah. expect them all to kind of raise the bar the same way with, say, Microsoft Teams. Well, they didn't have private channels. Yeah. And, and Microsoft I, it, said, oh, we better get us some of that. Uh -huh. I'm seeing this with uh, recently, uh, actually, actually yesterday, uh, just before we recorded this, I went and saw G Suites doing some stuff in terms of adding tasks and project windows and stuff within Gmail they're starting with. And I'm like, oh, so they're going after the task management apps. Like Google's finally making a play into that field to make tasks a little bit more robust. So I'm curious to see, and this is for, um, for basically for Google apps. So it's, for, it's, it's for the business side of things. Um, right. So I'm it, curious it really to see how that plays see out. How that plays out because yeah. Google, as you know, has got so many different lines of business, whether it's Google Cloud or um, Gmail or yeah, they're making hardware and mm -hmm. artificial intelligence and not to mention, I guess, Alphabet, which is the parent company and whether it's driverless cars or Calico with health, Slack and Zoom are so laser focused on communication. Now, yeah, all of Zoom's tools relate to each other. It's really a suite of tools that fall under the kind of horrible moniker of unified communication. But you know, Zoom isn't trying to do a million different things. So it's not surprising to me that Zoom is focused on user experience and focused on simplicity, whereas nothing against a Microsoft or Google or an Amazon, but you, you can't be everything to everybody. Well, and that's and that, that, that actually, this is, we'll, we'll, we'll deviate a little bit, but that to me is the, is the fascinating point is that, you know, there's that whole argument that um, people want to use an app that could, or, or a suite that can do everything for them, right? Like they, they, but then there's a certain set of people that are like, okay, Zoom does this really well. I'm just going to use Zoom. Oh wait, Meet Google Meet has shown up. Why don't we use that? No, 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 no. Um, th so it's that integration. People have this sense of, well, it, this is all Google products. So they've got Keep, they've got Meet, they've got this, they've got that. We'll just stay inside this box. But the problem that I see with that is that, and and I believe this wholeheartedly. I have for years back when I was, is that if third party developers are if they don't have users and you're not willing to pay for it then you're not going to get the best overall experience. You're not going to be pushing those Googles, those Apples, those Microsofts to build better products because there won't be any competition for them to worry about. I'll give way. you a perfect example. Do you remember Boomerang for Gmail? Oh, yeah. yeah. I used to love that, right? I gladly paid the 50 bucks because I'd get an email and go, you know what? I don't want to deal with it right now. Yep. Remind me on Monday. Well, Google shipped with Gmail snooze three or four years ago. Yeah, something it? like that. It was a lab feature for a while, and then they... It, right. Yeah. So I'll bet you a Coke that boomerang sales drop. Now, if I'm a developer mm -hmm. knowing that, right. And, and Apple's done that as well. And I always find it interesting when I watch WWDC, what is Apple adding and how much will it tick off the developers? Because I completely agree with you. Developers can move a lot faster than these larger companies. And if you irritate them too much, like Twitter is a perfect case in point. A lot of developers basically gave the finger to Twitter yep. because they would cut off their API and change the rules and said, I can develop for anything. So Slack and Zoom. Now, interestingly, Slack's got about 2,000 third-party apps. Zoom's got about 200. Mm -hmm. But given where Zoom is going, and I do mention a few in the book like otter.ai, which does transcription. Yep. And I can see in the future, kind of like with the Google Translate, let's say that you speak Spanish and I speak French, right? There could be not just it, um, an asynchronous translation, but what if while we, as we were talking, right? It's coming across in the different languages in real time and mm -hmm. it gets to be really good. So I really think that we're just in the first inning and yes, being able to do simple meetings for Pilates or podcasts or whatever is all great. But I do think it's this massive opportunity there because, and, and you probably just saw Amazon announced today that they were going to let corporate employees work from home yep. at least until 2021. Mm -hmm. I, I think my next book will wind up being about the future of work. And I do think it'll be a hybrid situation. So maybe you and I go to the office every once in a while to meet in, but mm -hmm. Given what Zoom is doing with telepresence, I write about that with Zoom Rooms or VR and AR, there will still be a little bit of a physical distance, but I can see that kind of eroding. I could see the same thing with going with school too, the future of school. Like, I mean, my kids are going to be going to school in a part, like it li it's likely part-time. They won't be going in, you know, for the full, because there'll be some remote learning component, which again, I don't necessarily think is a bad thing because in some cases, and I'm going to be very generalized here and maybe a bit polarizing is sometimes school for some people view it as babysitting. Like it's like I'm sending my kids to school so I can do work. That's not how I view it. And I don't think everybody views it that way, but sometimes it comes, it can come across that way. But if you've got an interactive component at home, it gets the parents more involved with the educational process, which is not a bad thing at all. 
It certainly makes it more transparent. I know that there are a lot of in the States, parents are saying, wait a minute, I'm paying $35,000 for this. Right, right. And the other thing is what I found it does too for the, on the other side is that teachers who have been unwilling to embrace things like Google Classroom things, they've had no choice. So the ones that have been like, I'm not going to do this. Now they have to, which again, increases. It, I've had so many uh, interactions with teachers in the past year who are like, we just do things by email. I'm like, why don't you just use Google Classroom? That way you hit everybody. It's so much more efficient. So, oh, I, but then I have to learn Google Classroom. Like it's really not much different than email in a lot of ways. Like you're just, but it's, it's that bias. It's that, it's that uh, I've always done it this way. And it's interesting sure. that a scenario that we're currently in right now has thrust us into change as opposed to, you know, anything else. You know who Scott Galloway is? The name sounds familiar to me, but it's uh, not. Smart Cookie, he's uh, started a bunch of companies. He teaches at NYU Stern, mm -hmm. uh, does a No Mercy, No Malice newsletter. And, okay. um, he's got his own podcast now, Professor D Show. But he's talked extensively about how COVID changes nothing, particularly with higher ed. It's just an accelerant. Right. So we would have gotten to this point a while ago, but well, we wouldn't have had to do it in such a compressed period of time because you are right. You can't teach a course via email. No. Right. And Blackboard and the Canvas learning management systems aren't nearly as good at collaboration as Slack and Zoom. So that's one reason that those companies and, and ditto with Microsoft Teams sure. had saw such explosive usage. We may have gotten there. In fact, there's a quote in the book. I'll probably bastardize it, but it was um, V.I. Lenin uh, from the Soviet Union who said there are decades in which weeks happen and there are weeks in which decades happen. This is what 2020, 2020 feels like the latter right yeah. now. So, so much is happening right now and you know, not, you know, it's a very privileged position to be able to do a lot of this from home, even though it may not be ideal. There are plenty of folks, whether they're restaurants or um, uh, retail workers who don't have the ability to do that. So I, I'm very bullish on these tools and I really enjoyed learning more about them as I wrote them. And it's certainly not, I don't think, let's say there was a vaccine tomorrow. Um, I don't think that all companies go back to the traditional world of work. There've been a lot of polls in which employees say, I'd love to work two or three days mm -hmm. from home. And in the past, bosses may not have been open to that because of old school mindsets. Well, now, and there's actually one of my former students, a really good guy, he, he, he argued for months, let me work from home for a day or two. And his boss didn't want him to do it. Well, now that he's been able to do it, he can see that he's still productive. So yeah. will we go back to that? Will companies like Facebook or Twitter pay a software engineer 90 grand in Iowa as opposed to 190 grand in San Francisco. Exactly. So it's going to be really interesting to see how not only it plays out, but how these tools evolve. You're right. And I think the accelerant is a really, really good point here. Now, um, as we get close to wrapping up, I'm going to look, we look at the book and it's divided up in a way like, like the one thing about dummies books that I've always appreciated is that um, they are referenced. So you can go in and go, I want to start here. I want to start there. You divide the book up in, you know, five parts and of course, the fifth part is the part of tens, which is in every dummy's book that I've ever come across. I think it's standard. Um, it if, is. <laughs> if, uh, if people are trying to adopt Zoom now or they're or let's say they let's say they're at a stage where they've been using Zoom and they're like in this. OK, I've been using I've been using. what more can I get out of it? Um, let's talk about like a tip that I think that maybe some people either they're they're, they're not necessarily aware of or that could make their Zoom experience that much better. And they go, they can maybe have that aha moment. I know I'm asking a bigger question here, but maybe yeah. the aha moment that you had when you were first using it or when you came across it during yeah. your... Yeah, forget webinars, forget Zoom phone, forget Zoom rooms. Mm -hmm. The tool that most people are using, I would argue, is Zoom meetings and chat. Mm -hmm. Right. Meetings and chat. So as, if I wanted to send you a file, I'm, I'm not going to send you an email with an attachment, Yeah. right? Um, you can, with the apps, integrate. So if you make an appointment with Outlook, right, it can suggest the Zoom meeting and you don't have to create it twice. Mm -hmm. So take advantage of the other things in, I'm going to say chapters five and six, uh, beyond just the meetings. And you can do all sorts of cool things. I, I go into a lot of depth over screen sharing because it's a little complicated. And fun fact, I don't know if you caught this from the book, but did you hear about that professor in Florida who was doing a screen share and he had a uh, bookmark in his browser Oh, that yes, I read about that. Yeah, a, a bookmark that he probably shouldn't have had. <laughs> yeah, I think we could say that. <laughs> and he didn't understand that he was sharing his screen. And, and Zoom provides so many options when it comes to screen sharing. And at first, I, it actually confused me because with Slack, it was basically, what do you want to show? Whereas mm -hmm. with Zoom, it was, you want to show just 
Microsoft Word or Google Chrome, or, or your, you want to show or your desktop phone, or your phone, like your which or, or a uh, camera. Yeah. yeah. So it, it can be a little overwhelming, but, but um, you know, don't try to drink from the fire hose. You know, read a few pages or go a few a few tips every time, and you'll realize that you know there is no need, in my opinion, whether it's Slack or Zoom or Teams, to use email as an internal collaboration tool. It doesn't make any sense. Right. If if I come back to do another book and you'll have me on the podcast again, I'll have all this history. It's all remember, you just gave me your address. So I won't have to ask you again yeah. for that versus going through an inbox with thousands and thousands of messages. So one of the tips that I will give people, because now I've done Zoom and Slack for dummies, and I also use Microsoft Teams, is pick a lane. Right. You will drive yourself insane if let's say we are connected on Teams and Slack and Zoom and we've exchanged a few emails and we also text. Well, and maybe this is a great idea for an app. There is no one app that searches everything, yeah. right? So I get why people say, no, I have to use email because everything's there. But again, email isn't good for synchronous communication and blah, blah, blah. So pick a lane and go with it. And if you don't want to use Zoom meetings and chat for texting and you want to use Slack, that's okay. But you'll drive yourself insane if it's, oh yeah, Mike, I do here, but John, I do there. Kramer, mm-hmm. I do here. And Jerry, I do there. You'll just... It's not well, good. it's interesting. You and I, the only place we communicate is Zoom. You started that in Zoom where you're like, we've done some emails, sure. But you kind of said, I'm going to, you went and said, I'm putting my chips in here. And I, I mean, I saw the dot. I'm like, okay, this is good because, and I have contacts in Zoom, but most of them, again, they're using email. And yeah, I mean, my wife and I have this setup where if we're talking about personal stuff, it's text message, like through a, but if we're talking about business stuff, it's through Slack. We talk about it's the, interesting. It, it's very uh, one clear. of the one of the things I learned researching the book and interviewing some people is that because there are so many mechanisms, um, you can really upset people, as I've been known to do, by suggesting that we use a tool. So uh, I think nothing of when someone sends me an email, "Hey, what's a good time to meet with you?" I use you can book dot me. Yep. You probably use I use I use Woven. Or, I love Woven. So yeah, okay. But some people are offended, right? You want me to use your tool? How dare you? So I I find it very inefficient. Okay, how's Monday at 7? No, how's Tuesday at 6? It drives me crazy. And again, if it's um, worth it, then I will kind of bite my tongue. But there are people who say, no, I have a strong preference for this, that, and the other thing. But again, then you get into power dynamics. And if I'm going to be on your podcast as a guest, if you said, Bill, we have to use Skype, I've got Skype yep. here. Something tells me you wouldn't insist upon it. So um, yeah, it, it can be a little overwhelming with all these tools, but uh, in the book, I really try to demystify it. And the same with the Slack book. But if you know what the at symbol does, that's going to call attention to someone and start a notification. And if you want to customize notifications on the text side of Zoom meetings and chat, right? Well, then you know what, Mike, you're too chatty. I don't want to deal with you. I'm going to put you on um, right. mute for a little while. So right. it isn't an all or nothing thing, unlike an inbox in which, yeah, you can set up different rules, but fundamentally you've got a new message. Oh, what is it? Versus, oh, I have a new message from Mike. I don't want to hear from Mike now. I'll deal with him later. So it's a much more flexible tool, just like Slack when it comes to notifications and really keeping your sanity. So Phil, the book, uh, you can pre-order it now. It's called Zoom for Dummies. They can get it, uh, I guess, Amazon, wherever, where, and where can they keep up with you as well? BillSimon.com. Okay. And by the way, if you're listening to this episode now and you haven't listened to the Slack episode, this is a good back to back. Like I think you should do go back. Uh, of course, the links in the show notes, do these back to back. And uh, I'm actually going to ask, I don't normally, normally don't do this on the podcast, but um, I usually do solo episodes uh, what, once a week as well. But Phil, I want to talk to you about a new email service really quickly. We're not going to do this right now in this recording, but an, another podcast episode that uh, I want to talk to you about your thoughts on that really quickly. We only need about 15 minutes. So again, if you're, uh, uh, yep, that's the one. (laughs) So we're going to talk about that. You can get that Uh, again. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to this episode. Thanks, Phil, for joining me today. And until next time, uh, this is Mike Vardy, the host of the Productivities Podcast, reminding you to stop guessing and start going. See you later.